Our first speaker uh, this evening is uh, our, our faculty's perhaps uh, preeminent uh, expert in the theology and life of uh, Martin Luther, uh, Dr. Gordon Isaac, who's the Associate Berkshire Professor of Advent uh, uh, Christian Studies, and among his uh, numerous publications, the most recent of which is, which I think is available for sale at some point here, Prayer, Meditation, and Spiritual Trial, Luther's Account of life in the spirit. So Luther is not only a great biblical scholar and theologian, but also deeply concerned about spirituality and the grace of God as it impacts uh, the Christian life. So Dr. Isaac, please come forward. Let's welcome Dr. Gordon Isaac. On October 31st, 1517, a solitary figure walked the full length of the small town of Wittenberg, Germany, population 2,000. The 35-year-old Augustinian friar held in his hand a copy of a set of theses written for the purpose of inviting a disputation on the power and efficacy of indulgences. Martin Luther had asked his printer, Johann Rau Grunenberg, to run off a few copies for his personal use. As disputations were extremely common in academic circles, this action was by no mean attention getting. It is likely that there was no one there to witness the printed copy being nailed to the door of the castle church. Luther did not craft these theses thinking that he was beginning a movement or that he was initiating a controversy that would reshape Western Christianity. He had no aspirations to become the head of a renewal movement, and he was no moral crusader. He simply knew that his parishioners were suffering under the weight of medieval theological constructions that obscured the bright light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted nothing more than to care for the people in his charge and to think theologically. So Luther directed these theses against the system of indulgences in place in the church at the time. Common laity would often purchase letters of indulgence thinking that they were reducing the amount of time their loved ones would have to spend in purgatory. Others would purchase them for themselves, thinking that they were relieving the temporal punishments exacted by the church, or at worst, the laity thought that they were purchasing the forgiveness of sins with a few coins. Luther was infuriated at the corruption of church doctrine and, more importantly, the deception it produced in the laity. The first thesis states, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Luther knew that the true treasure of the church is not letters of indulgence, but the gospel of the glory and grace of God shown in Jesus Christ. What happened next was nothing short of extraordinary. Without authorization, a few of Luther's students translated the 95 Theses into German and had them published and distributed. They were reprinted in Leipzig, Nuremberg, and Basel. What was normally a bit of academic ephemera had with this action entered the bloodstream of the European intellectual community. Barely two weeks later, the Theses had circulated all over Germany. And finally, this set of, set of Theses made their way to England where Thomas More received a copy sent from his friend Desiderius Erasmus, another Roman Catholic man of letters. With the aid of the newly invented printing press, Luther and his cause became an overnight sensation. It was not the 95 Theses themselves that had such a revolutionary effect on posterity. The decisive event was the subsequent debate on the questions of the fallibility of the councils, the supreme power of the pope, and the right to admonish the church on scriptural grounds to change its ways. In short, the Reformation raised the question of the nature of the gospel and how that gospel is to be preached. Now, in fact, if I were to hazard a brief definition of the central importance of the Reformation that we celebrate in this conference, I would say it this way. Evangelical theology, as articulated in the Augsburg Confession of 1530, is an ecumenical proposal to the church universal regarding the critical criterion by which gospel speaking properly takes place. 
The content of evangelical theology embraces both Old and New Testaments because the God of Israel is the Father of Jesus. And this Jesus, in his life, ministry, death, and resurrection, is the event of final destiny that is, at once, the fulfillment of Jewish hope and Gentile need, proclaimed to all people by the church. Now, it can be put in this direct manner. Jesus the Israelite is risen and has death behind him. Therefore, nothing can now overcome his will for you and what will become of the human enterprise and of your participation in it is in the hands of this man of hope and no other. There's reason for all your struggles. This gospel is an unconditional promise that's conveyed through the preached word and the sacraments of the word. In the time of the Reformation, as in our own time, gospel preaching breaks through the spent thought forms of culture to create a new reality. Just as the word was spoken by God in Genesis, let there be light, and there was light, so in the preaching of Christ there is a death and a resurrection, a new birth that establishes a new creation a creation that is based on the unconditionality of Jesus' self-giving. In the time of the Reformation, evangelical theology rejected the assertion of the medieval church that tended to think from human action to God. In its place, the Reformation was an attempt to think according to the gospel word that had created a new and different structure from God to humanity in the Bible and in the Reformation, that structure, that way, is called faith. The heart of the Reformation, at least since the 19th century, has been summarized by the four solas, the organizing principle of the conference that we are sitting in now, by grace alone, by faith alone, by Christ alone, and by scripture alone. Now, it's my task to say a few words about Luther's view of sola scriptura, something I'm happy to do. And what I will show is that Luther is anxious to promote the primacy of Scripture in such a way that it can, on the one hand, challenge and tear down those things that stand opposed to the gospel, and on the other hand, build up those things that promote the centrality and preeminence of Jesus Christ. So the Scriptura becomes a Christological formula in Luther's hands in such a way that the Word of God is the fountain and source for the church's salvation, life, and action. Thus, we anticipate something of our findings by noting that each of the solas is contained or implied in the other solas. We see this as Luther sets out the power of scripture to create faith in the lives of those who read and study it. For only then do we see the grace of God retrieving from sin, the righteousness of faith strengthening the believer, and thus Christ becoming preeminent in the church. We'll proceed in three stages to set out Luther's approach to sola scriptura. First, we must follow Luther's way from scholastic theology toward a Bible-centered approach to theology that he establishes as the norm at the University of Wittenberg. Second, we must take up what Luther means as he asserts that Christ is the sole content of scripture. And finally, we'll consider Luther's conviction that Holy Scripture authenticates itself. First, Luther's move away from scholastic theology to a Bible-centered approach is one that develops over time but is critical for understanding the Reformation. Since the 12th century, teachers such as Lombard and Abelard had adopted Aristotelian principles as means of clarifying biblical thinking and engaging thinkers from outside the Christian framework. It was a blend of biblical teaching with Neoplatonic philosophical perspective, part of Augustine's legacy, as well as that of Aristotle. Now, as it turns out, Luther actually retained certain aspects of his scholastic training, but he has a sharp reaction to the view of human nature that was set out by Gabriel Beale, one of the foremost nominalists of his time. Beale had attempted to balance the teaching of God's grace and human performance by insisting that out of purely natural powers, sinners could do that which is in them, facere in quote se est. By doing their best, they could win congruent merit 
a worthiness or righteousness before God that's not truly worthy, but nonetheless accepted by God as the basis for receiving his grace. Beale followed the Aristotelian tradition and placed at the center of his description of salvation the gift of a habit or a disposition. This disposition supplied power to perform acts that are truly worthy or righteous in God's sight. It was this view of things that Luther reacted against. In his Romans commentary, he states, the scholastic theologians have not spoken sufficiently clearly about sin and grace, for they have been under the delusion that original sin, like actual sin, is entirely removed. The ancient fathers, Augustine and Ambrose, spoke entirely differently and in the way scripture does. But those men speak in the manner of Aristotle in his ethics when he bases sin and righteousness on works, both their performance and omission. Now there are many other passages in this commentary where Luther urges against an undue reliance on the wisdom that philosophy can give, preferring instead the kind of wisdom that scripture imparts. The point for Luther is this, philosophy will yield earthly knowledge, but scripture brings heavenly knowledge. That's the difference between thinking ad modem Aristoteles and ad modem scripturae, thinking in the manner of Aristotle or thinking in the manner of scripture. Luther's determination to think in the manner of scripture leads him to question the scholastic approach to theology altogether. This opposition becomes quite pointed as illustrated by a string of comments made in his disputation against scholastic theology. Theses 43 and 44 read this, in this way. It is an error to say that no man can become a theologian without Aristotle. This in opposition to common opinion. Indeed, no one can become a theologian unless he becomes one without Aristotle. And as if this were not compelling enough, he sums up in Thesis 50 by saying, briefly, the whole of Aristotle is to theology as darkness is to light. This in opposition to the scholastics. Now Luther's theological insights also have pastoral focus. Looking out on the situation, this is what he says. The greatest part of my cross is to see brothers with brilliant gifts born for good studies, and yet compelled to spend their life and waste their achievement in these follies. But in Wittenberg, a new direction had been set, and in May of 1517, he could write, our theology and St. Augustine are going ahead and reign in our university, and it is God's work. Aristotle is gradually going down, perhaps into eternal ruin, it is wonderful how the lectures on the sentences are out of favor. Nobody can hope for an audience unless he professes this theology, that is, the Bible, or St. Augustine, or some doctor of real authority in the church. Luther's devotion to scripture and the theology that emerges from it leads to a major change in the curriculum at the University of Wittenberg. This is put to the test at the Leipzig Disputation in the year 1519. The significance of the Leipzig Disputation was that it was the first dispute over the Reformation. Further, it's important that Johannes Eck provoked Luther's first public challenge to the idea of the divine right of papal authority. But it's also, it also inaugurated a new way of arguing cases such as these. Instead of arguing exclusively on the basis of scholastic theologians, Luther had argued from church fathers and scripture. In addition, Luther argued from history. For example, he had asserted that the Roman church did not have authority over the Greek church, for the Greek church was never subject to the pope. He dealt with papal decretals and conciliar decrees, subjecting all to the authority of scripture. He went further to say that the pope does not have the authority to promulgate any new doctrine that cannot be shown from scripture. The disputation is important for this new way of arguing doctrine in the church. What we need to see is this. For Luther, sola scriptura is not something that can be reduced to a doctrine about scripture as it is in itself, 
But in his case, and the case of the Reformation, sola scriptura embraces an overhaul of the university curriculum and it initiates a new way of adjudicating theological questions in the church. In short, it's the mobilizing of a renewal movement within the church Catholic that takes seriously the approach of the early church that always sought to read the Holy Scriptures in light of the regular fide. Second, we take up what Luther means by saying that Christ is the sole content of Scripture. Now, Luther's well aware of the manifold character of Holy Scripture. He makes note of the difference in the way that the Gospel writers set out the life of Christ. And he notes how the Apostle Paul sets out Christ without dealing in the historical details that the Gospel writers do. His translation and exposition of the Old Testament puts him in contact with the laws, the wisdom literature, the prophecies and poetry that are found there. On this level, the Bible is a collection of diverse literary genres. However, taken theologically, and that means in terms of what the Bible promotes, Luther sees the Bible as a great unity. For him, there is but one author, and it has only one content, that is Christ. As Luther says, there is no doubt that all the scripture points to Christ alone. Or again, take Christ out of the scriptures and what more will you find there? Or again, all scripture everywhere deals only with Christ. The relationship between Christ and the incarnate word of God and scripture as the written word of God is intimate and mutually corroborating. The function of scripture, its goal, is to make known and promote Jesus Christ and all those who read and all those who hear it preached. We find Luther teaching this approach to scripture to the laity in his prefaces to the Bible. Now, Luther had full confidence in the power of the Bible to tell its own story. But he wrote the prefaces because there had been so many misleading comments in the past. In light of this situation, he wanted to set the record straight regarding the purpose and proper way to read Holy Scripture. Luther suggests that there's a twofold manner in which the works of Christ are grasped. The first and most important is receiving Christ as gift. Being joined to the living Christ through faith is the essence of the gospel. The second is receiving Christ as example where we see how he prays, helps people, and shows them love. In this way, we know how to order our lives. Holy Scripture is not to be viewed as a book of laws or commandments, for its chief purpose and end is to set forward the gospel. It is thus not a fixed repository of unchanging eternal truths by which the believer and the world is to be measured. Rather, the purpose of Scripture is to convey the chronicle, the story, the narrative about Christ. Seen in this light, Scripture is a book of divine promises in which God promises, offers, and gives us all his possessions and benefits in Christ. The Bible is read rightly when it sets forward Christ in this way. But as Luther likes to point out, Christ is not simply gift for us. He is also example. Receiving Christ's gift sets faith in motion and begins to produce works of obedience as a result. Therefore, make note of this, that Christ as a gift nourishes your faith and makes you a Christian, but Christ as an example exercises your works. These do not make you a Christian. Actually, they come forth from you because you have already been made a Christian. As widely as a gift differs from an example, so widely does faith differ from works. For faith possesses nothing of its own, only the deeds and life of Christ. Works have something of your own in them, yet they should not belong to you, but to your neighbor. Scripture is both law and gospel, finds its source in Christ. Understood in this way, Scripture is a unity with Christ as its sole content. Third, we consider Luther's idea that Holy Scripture authenticates itself. We've already seen that Luther argues the priority of Scripture on the basis of its content, it is a book like no other because it drives home Christ and thus has the power to create faith. For Luther, the authority of Scripture is material and content-driven. 
It is the voice of its author, and it is able to make one wise unto salvation. This is what Luther means when he says, Sacra Scriptura Sui Ipsius Interpres, Holy Scripture interprets itself. Luther uses the capacity of scripture to convey its own message and to create faith on its own as an argument against the Roman Catholic thesis that it is only the church which has established the canon and therefore actually guarantees the authority of scripture. Luther points out that this makes little sense. It would be like saying John the Baptist is greater than Christ because he pointed, out, he pointed to him at the Jordan River. And on the basis of what Paul says in Galatians 1.9, Luther further argues that Holy Scripture is the queen who rules and everyone, including Pope, Luther, Augustine, Paul, or an angel from heaven, must be subject to her and be witnesses, disciples, and confessors of Scripture. Now, this is a rather powerful way of saying that no one is in a position to validate Scripture. It is Scripture that validates itself. The church's attitude toward scripture can only be that of placing itself in a position of obedient listening and recognition of the witness scripture bears to itself as God's word. Now that's precisely what Luther did. Quote, for some years now, the doctor said, I have read through the Bible twice every year. If you picture the Bible to be a mighty tree and every word a little branch, I have shaken every one of those branches because I wanted to know what it was and what it meant. Or again, he could say this, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet, it runs after me. It has hands, it lays hold of me. Clearly, there's much more that could be said of Luther's view of scripture, but what we have attempted here is a good beginning. Luther was a man who immersed himself in the message of the Bible. He spent time reading and rereading the text to determine what it was that the Holy Spirit was trying to say. He allowed the words of Scripture to cascade over his intellect in life-changing ways. It gave him a resolve to change what was out of line with the gospel message in his time. He spent a lifetime translating it into the vernacular of his German people with such success that the Luther Bible helped to codify the German language. His prayerful approach to the text is one to celebrate and one to emulate in this 500th anniversary of the Reformation and the establishment of evangelical theology. Thank you. Dr. Isaac, we have some brief opportunities here. So if you have a question for Dr. Isaac on Sola Scriptura, or otherwise, there are microphones on the stands. Uh, please come forward there and uh, state your uh, uh, question. Okay, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. When I was a child in Cambridge at the corner store, one could buy a small pie called a table talk pie. A table talk would please, pie. Would you please explain to us what it means Explain to us, please, what it means when someone, uh, uh, an observer, writes a book or an account called somebody's table talk, like uh, Luther's table talk. That's a good question. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Luther was famous for his ability to coin a phrase. His witty quips are well known. And uh, Luther had, uh, had been given and broken down uh, to uh, take us his home. And his wife, Katie, and he usually had a number of students that would live with him in the house. So they'd go around, uh, they'd sit down at dinner, and they would have their dinner. And then after dinner, they'd push back, and they would ask questions. And Luther would say wonderful things. Table talk is recorded. There were several students of his that actually took down notes. It became published. And uh, it reads something like a theological comic book. There are places where you can read it and you'll just break out laughing out loud. There are other places where Luther explodes like a volcano talking about important theological things like the doctrine of the Trinity 
or how it is that the Holy Spirit lays the cross upon us so that our own lives will be formed into the image of Christ. It's really wonderful reading. Lots of it's great stuff. So thanks for the question about table talk. I think we have time for one more, uh, another question. Uh, Dr. Adonis Vidu. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have a question in relation to the indulgences. The selling of the indulgences. <clears throat> I was wondering whether you could uh, venture a little bit of historical speculation here. Had there been less corruption uh, at the time that Luther was writing in, had there been no selling of indulgences by the Catholic Church, do you think Luther's reaction to scholasticism, medieval scholasticism, would have been somewhat milder? Thank you. That's an interesting question. I think I would say um, the two are somewhat unrelated. I, I would say they are unrelated. I think if uh, the church had not been uh, practicing indulgences, uh, I think he still would have had a very sharp reaction against scholastic theology, and the Reformation would have been inevitable in that regard. Yeah, good question, thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Isaac, I, I have a question. Someone else may have well, one too, but uh, I guess in Luther's day, scholastic theology, Aristotle, by the way, I think there is something be said in favor of Aristotle, but that's a different, <laughs> different. Uh, that's a different question. Uh, scholastic theology was a screen that uh, impeded a more spiritual reading of Scripture, apparently, right? So, would you uh, say, in our own modern culture, uh, is is there any equivalent of a scholastic uh, mindset or scholastic theology which might impede our encounter with Scripture today? Hmm. Well, my goodness, let's see how to unpack that question. Um, well, I, you know, I, I think that the reading of scripture is, uh, you know, a question in every age. And it's fascinating, you know, when I teach church history courses, one of the things we do is we, we read texts side by side, two different people. So today, uh, actually class from two to five today. Yeah. So uh, we, we were working with, um, we were working with Augustine and we were working with Pelagius. Pelagius, on the one hand, reads the same Bible that Augustine does, but he camps out on different texts. And he says, you know, Romans chapter six, um, sin will not uh, have domination over you. That's where he camps out. Uh, Augustine, on the other hand, uses some different scriptures arguing against his overly confident view of human nature to say, if you're saying that we can do good works uh, without Christ, then Christ died to no avail. And so the argument goes. So the, the matter of reading scripture is always a dicey business and you find people uh, reading past one another in those kinds of instances.